Welcome to BizHack Live. My name is Dan Gretsch. I'm the host of BizHack Live and the CEO and founder of BizHack Academy, a digital marketing training academy for small businesses. And it is my distinct pleasure uh, to welcome Tatiana McDaniel, a, a dear friend who was there from the very birth of BizHack uh, seven years ago at Miami Dade College. We were called Market Hack back then to talk about her new role as the CMO of an e-commerce company after many years of being the head uh, or working in agencies on behalf of other companies. Now she's in-house and she's going to share some of the biggest lessons that she's learned going from the agency world to being the CMO of a growing e-commerce company. Um, and uh, I want to first acknowledge our partners who have made BizHack Live possible and promoted it to their communities, American Marketing Association, Creation Station uh, in Fort Lauderdale, CIC, the co-working space, South Florida Integrated Marketing Association, and Miami Marketers. Thank you so much uh, for sponsoring us and for making BizHack Live possible. Um, I wanted to share with you next week, uh, over the last seven years from when Tati started with BizHack, to today, we have been developing, honing, refining, and perfecting a system for helping small businesses, folks with limited time, money, and budget generate leads in a cost-effective way. And we call that the lead building system. And I'm very excited to share that with you next week in a 90-minute webinar. It's really a preview of the course, the paid course that we do, um, where we actually help you implement the lead building system into your uh, business. But the, the structure of the lead building system can really help you figure out how to approach your own marketing um, and how to think through where to get started and the confusing world of marketing. We've spent a lot of time trying to simplify it without making it overly simple. Um, the week after that, we're then celebrating the graduation of our current cohort, the Digital Titans. These are the folks who are right now going through our five-week program. They are launching their second ads this week, a retargeting ad using lead generation objective to try to generate leads and close sales. And uh, Tati is one of the marketing coaches and is working with our extraordinary group of scholars through this program to help them actually close sales. Uh, I've had the pleasure of being one of the coaches this semester, and one of the people I'm working with had 12 prospects in their first ad. They spent $200 and they had 12 sales prospects, and we're gonna see how whether he can close any of them in the next couple of weeks. On average, our participants actually make $29 in revenue for every $1 in ad spend while they're taking the program. The week after that, we're going to then look at Clubhouse, the biggest new platform in social media. Dennis Yu of Blitz Metrics is going to talk about how to think about Clubhouse as a small business and how to use it to grow your business rather than just have it be yet one more uh, pull on your very precious time. And uh, thank you, those of you who have been part of our season pass. Uh, this gives you access uh, um, to all of the BizHack paid and unpaid webinars, as well as the uh, follow-up emails where we give you extra resources, special offers like the one Tati's going to give, and copies of our presentations. Without further ado, I want to welcome Tatiana McDaniel. Tati is the CMO of Happy V, a women's wellness company. You can imagine what the V means. And uh, her marketing focus is on educating and supporting women. She spent a decade working at agencies such as YNR and Zimmerman, working with other brands on their marketing. And she's managed campaigns in travel and leisure, retail and luxury, beauty, nonprofit, um, CPGs, electronics, and digital finance. Tati is uh, kind of a data nerd. She loves analyzing consumer behavior and consumption trends, but then she applies that to storytelling, how to actually help build a brand that actually drives results. She went to University of Florida with a major in advertising. And one of the things that I find incredibly um, amazing about Tati is when she studied advertising, 
and she's not that old, at University of Florida, one of the top schools, um, she actually did not cover digital marketing at all, except for, I think you said, one class that talked yep. about Twitter. That's exactly right. <laughs> one uh, class. And um, one quick thing, by the way, Tati, if you could just, I don't know if you can move your camera a little bit so that your head is getting cut off a little. Oh, yeah. that better? Perfect. That's perfect. So Tati, before we launch into your presentation, I am curious about that. You know, as an advertising person, someone who studied advertising in school and then now is practic practicing it, um, did you learn, um, I mean, it seems like you had to learn everything on the job that even at the school level, uh, even having graduated a little more than a decade ago, 15 years ago, digital marketing like wasn't even a thing then. Yeah, it's so crazy and interesting because when I decided to get into the field of marketing, I was really drawn and pulled by the idea of consumer behavior and kind of the psychology behind consumption patterns, purchasing patterns, and sort of what triggers somebody to choose one product over another. And so the competitive landscape was really appealing to me, but it was more the strategy behind advertising and not necessarily the placements of where you were advertising, so the specific media. Um, and so what's great is that since that was my draw, that now applies to an even deeper level with digital. So understanding the consumer has its strategy, whether it's traditional media or digital media, um, but that fundamental I've carried through. And so I now apply it more on a digital sense, but it's great because now I get a ton of data, whereas with traditional media, uh, you're, you're much less limited, you're much more limited actually. So what really inspired, thank you for sharing that. And you know, one of the things that um, we really try to do at BizHack is connect timeless principles of marketing, the marketing funnel, the four, four Ps, the um, understanding your ideal target audience, and then applying them, translating that into a digital world and leveraging digital tools to make your uh, job as a marketer even more profound and powerful. Because the, the amount of data you have, the amount of insight you have is really unrivaled. Um, I wanted to, to start with what really inspired me to want to feature you today, which is you kind of mentioned during one of our meetings, uh, instructional meetings, that you oversaw a TikTok that went viral and ended up causing your entire stock of Happy Bee products to sell out almost overnight. And I wanted to first talk, have you share with us what was the TikTok that went viral and then what happened next? Sure, so first I think it's important to get a little bit of context around how our business is structured. So we are, as Dan mentioned, a dietary supplement manufacturing company. So we focus all of our sales on the e-com. And we have a few different marketplaces where we sell. We sell on our website, we sell um, through our social media platforms and then on Amazon. So, dietary supplements, we have various categories, but the one of this specific TikTok was in the women's wellness brands. Um, and that's the Happy Bee. So initially when we launched this brand, probably like two years ago, our focus was really Instagram and Facebook. That's where after doing a lot of analysis, we realized our audience is in. We're also a very lean team. So I always say this to everybody that I work with, coach, um, any of my business partners, if you're going to be on a social media platform, you've got to do it right. Having a handle, having a presence that's on and off, that's sporadic, um, and that doesn't have consistency isn't going to help you grow in that particular platform. So it's better to have a strong presence in two than a mediocre presence across five or six. And so in deciding to focus on Instagram and Facebook, you know, we were doing Instagram and Facebook to the best of our ability. Then rolls around TikTok that is now taking over the space. It's also very much appealing to a younger generation that advertisers need to be thinking about. Gen Z is the next millennials. And so being where those audiences are was really important for us. And so we decided to slightly shift gears, take a look at TikTok and decide, okay, we're gonna start posting on TikTok. Not really having a strategy, just sort of throwing a few things and seeing what stuck. And so 
we did this. We started in about November of last year. And in January, we did this TikTok post, which I'm going to share with you guys that went viral. So I can share my screen here. Let's see. Oh, it looks like, here we go. Okay, give me one second to pull it up. And while she's doing that, I wanna encourage everybody to ask questions. Click on the little Q&A button on the bottom of your screen. And if you have any questions for Tati, I'll be sure to fold them in as we talk. Um, today's really gonna be a conversation with Tati. It's a great chance for you to ask uh, a CMO about how she does her job. All right, so everyone seeing my screen, this is our Happy V TikTok. So I'll just take you through it really quickly. My Happy V, funny story, um, but also a great tip. When we opened up our Instagram page, which was the first page we opened, we decided to name it My Happy V because Happy V was taken. And after a long time of trying to reach out to the person who owned the Happy V handle, we got no response. I think, you know, our messages got, just got lost in the DM. And so we added the my, and now we own my Happy V as our Instagram handles or as our social handles, I should say, across all of our platforms. And for businesses that are just starting, you might find that the exact name that you're looking for is taken. The reality is today, that's okay. Add official, add the real add a little word that can kind of go before or after your business name and that's fine and 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 people in marketing and marketers understand that a lot of names are already going to be taken it's sort of what was originally happened with the urls um there are businesses now that go and buy and get a lot of handles and so no need to purchase another handle you can just create um create another one by adding a couple words to the front or back of that so Back to the TikTok page, My Happy V. Um, we have, as you can see, 15,000 followers. We actually have more followers at one point than we did on Instagram. And we've been on Instagram for almost three years and TikTok for a couple of months. So the growth opportunity in TikTok is tremendous. Um, we've gotten already 45,000 likes in our TikTok videos. So I'm going to go and show you the specific video that if you look at this, if you take a look, this number here at the bottom left of each of the videos is the amount of times that the video was viewed. So we started with a mediocre 7,000 views, which if you ask me is not that bad. Um, then we had this fourth video here that got almost 15,000 views. And we got really excited about that. So we decided to create a second video similar to that one, which was storytelling format. And this is what TikTok videos are all about. You're telling a story, but in a really condensed, um, you know, 10, 15 seconds. And so this is our video, which got over 600,000 views. I had been for over five years and switched my gynecologist five different times. All of them Jessica prescribing antibiotics, not helping me get to the root cause. I tried every product for vaginal infections and nothing was working. So I took it upon myself to do research as to why nothing was solving my BV. And I discovered 22 million women suffer from BV each year in the United States. There had to be a solution that worked. So I turned to my partner who owns a dietary supplement manufacturing facility and we got to work. We created the first vertically integrated vaginal wellness company called Happy V that believes in science-backed ingredients, transparency, education, and helping women find relief. Since we launched in 2019, we've helped over thousands of women find relief. Follow us to learn more about vaginal wellness. I had BB for over five years and okay. switched my gynecologist. So that was the video and in order to put this video together. Can I, can I say something? Yes. <laughs> you know, I used to work at NPR and the audio quality was really low. Uh -huh. And what I love about this is it doesn't matter. It doesn't matter. It's like what works is what works. Yep. And the authenticity and the, the slight like echoing, like, 
I would get fired if I, like at NPR, tried to put something like that out, but it doesn't matter. Like the audience doesn't stress about that. They care about the story. And um, I just wanna, before you kind of launch into it, yep. I'm constantly having to remind myself that perfect is the enemy of the good and that delayed um, implementation, uh, delayed perfection versus timely implementation, just get her done. So anyway, uh, back to you. I I I love uh, that um, that video, and it's totally. I have no idea what BV is, so it's like it doesn't speak to me at all. But I'm not your audience, so that's fine. You're not our audience. Um, so you actually took the words right out of my mouth because when we decided to do this video, using TikTok is it's like anything new. Um, I think just because it's a technology that has a lot of different components, people are like, oh, I don't even know how to get into that. Um, it's the same as, you know, learning a new app. You just have to get familiar and get in and mess around with it as much as you can. And you'll start getting the gist of how things are done, um, how the editing is done, et cetera. So what we did with little experience, I mean, four posts worth of experience, you can see right there, is we scripted the story that we wanted to say. And so that's where I dedicate some time, um, most of my time in, whether it's a TikTok video, whether it's an Instagram post or story or an email that we're gonna send to our customers, it's what is the story that we're trying to tell and what do we want the customer to take away from that story? So then after having something scripted like this video, then we hand it off to our team who sort of puts it all together and tells the story. So the really interesting thing is that my co-founder posted this to, to TikTok. And afterwards, I was like, Daniela, there's a typo in our brand name. So I don't know if anybody caught it, but Happy V on one of the frames has a U after it. Um, also, also talking about imperfections, there are a few places here and there where she stutters because it's my, it's Daniela. She does the voiceover where she's like stuttering and, and, and she's like, gosh, should I have re-recorded it? And so she'll send it to me back and forth. And this happens a lot with other videos, not that just this one it did happen with this one a couple of times. Um, but again, piggybacking on Dan's comments about the audio, about, you know, it, it's not perfect. It isn't a perfectly produced video. But what we're seeing now in social media is more appeal towards vulnerability and towards authenticity. And sure, you can authentically re-record something 15 times until there's no, you know, no errors, no hiccups, and it's perfect. And as your brand grows, you're going to want that for your brand. But when you're starting out, Nobody has the time to record a TikTok video 17 different times until they get the perfect shot, especially when you're the CEO, the CMO of a business, and you have so many other things to deal with, like inventory management, shipping of products, quality control, to be re-recording a video. And so you know what we just said? We're going to post it as is, and we got ha over half a million views. So moral of that story is done is better than perfect. If it's done and you can get it up, get it up and, and see how your audience reacts. And then you can work towards perfection, but perfection really never comes <laughs> when you own a business. Always, always areas to improve and always opportunities to make things better. Um, but yeah, we were, we were blown away with the success um, Dan, I don't know if you want to chime in before I sort of give the the climax or the you know the aftermath of this. Yeah, you, you know, I just um, sometimes you need to just set parameters or or like hire someone or pay someone to hold you accountable. Just set a deadline. You know, take a class where there are assignments with deadlines. You know, get a coach. But um, you know, a lot of us who are business owners, who are marketers are type A perfectionists. And I know my background in journalism has actually inhibited my ability as a, as a marketer because, you know, if I had a typo, we had to run a, a, a correction in the newspaper and we would have these tracked and then we would, um, you know, uh, uh, you know, 
have these like docked from your annual report. And frankly, if you had too many corrections in a year, you weren't going to stay working. In contrast, you know, Tati's most viral post in her life misspelled the name of her company. <laughs> That's great. I, mi I totally missed that. Uh, but now I'm going to use this as a story forevermore. Um, <laughs> all right. So I think before you get to what happened next, just talk about, um, you know, this was a marketing piece, right, yeah. with a goal towards selling product. And so can you just take us through the customer journey of the TikTok, like how those views converted into purchases and then tell us what happened next. Sure. So our particular category of product is something that is searched quite often. So it's not like accessories or clothing or, or D to C direct to consumer products that you can stumble upon and decide to buy. When you're purchasing our products and our category, you're actively searching for this product either by name or by the description of your symptoms. So we've found that selling our product on searched platforms like Amazon, we all know when we go on Amazon to purchase something, we're searching a name. Um, we're not just browsing. I mean, sometimes we'll go and we'll browse like what's on sale or, 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 or the, you know, the weekly discount areas or, or the promo areas. Um, but that's about it. For the most part on Amazon, we're searching, we're looking and we know what we're looking for. So a lot of our content on social media is driving people to our Amazon page before even our website. And that's a strategy that we decided to implement, especially now in the beginning where we're getting exposure and recognition. When you're a new brand and people don't know about you, you have to be in the places where people are shopping. So if no one knows about your brand, how are they going to get to your website? But if they learn about your brand through other marketplaces like Amazon, then you start to create awareness and you start to be in the places where people are shopping. So, <laughs> so we launched this ad and the reality is all of our content has, is twofold intention. We want to educate people. That's what we're here to do. Dan said it himself. He doesn't know what BV is. So a lot of people don't know. And some people don't need to know. But for the people who are going through any kind of infection or, or biological discomfort, there are solutions. So we're here to explain to you and to educate you on what some of those solutions are and offer one to you. Doesn't mean you have to go with our product, but... We show you the science, we show you all of what makes us credible to the consumer, then it's their decision whether or not to come to go with our product. So we launched this ad, not very salesy, but more educational. And what we found was that our website visits increased by 50% from the previous day before we had launched. And we're a small brand, we're probably getting I don't know, six or 7,000 visits to our website every month. So it's not a tremendous amount. It's not tens of thousands of visits. Um, and in the day that we launched and the days after, our numbers went up to like 13, 14,000. So that was huge for us. The numbers have kind of simmered back down and we're sort of in a median in between those two. Obviously spikes do occur, but we realized there was nothing else. Because here's the other thing. When you see spikes, whether it's spikes in sales, spikes in website visits, spikes in Instagram, Facebook activity, you have to take a step back and think of all of the different factors that can attribute to that spike. Is there a national holiday around that? And so that perhaps spiked the increase of your sales and your products. Is there a promo that you were running that was about to expire? Did you post a video that went viral, but you have to assess every single option of what it could have done, what it could have been that triggered that success. So we hadn't really done anything else aside from this TikTok video. And so saw all the increase in traffic to our website and also an instant increase in sales um, on our Amazon page. So there was a point where we were getting where we were getting an averaging a sale per every five minutes, which is insane. We like, it didn't last forever. 
Um, but otherwise I would be like on a boat, on a yacht in, the, in Greece or something right now, but it didn't last forever. And that's the reality is you're going to see these spikes in sales, but we did get a good few hours where we were just getting constant, constant sales. So this is an amazing thing. We almost thought that like something was wrong, but obviously the viewers of this video enjoyed it, identified with it and decided to take action, which was the most important thing. And it caused our entire inventory to sell out in 48 hours. So that was unexpected. And one of those, um, one of those interesting things that happen when you have to pivot in your business very quickly because you weren't expecting that type of success. So obviously inventory depleted, what do you do? Well, you just went from a wonderful celebration to, oh crap, panic mode. Um, but we have obviously in store a lot of our raw materials in storage because the partners that I work with own their own manufacturing facility. So that's really a unique benefit that we have that some people can't really rely on um, because storage of a lot of raw material, especially things that expire, um, it's difficult. It's difficult. So we were lucky enough to have that to rely back on, push everybody to get to work over the weekend to do a, diff a, a separate run, a manufacturing run, different from our regular scheduled runs, um, and get the product back on the market within 48 hours. And we had to do a ton of customer service to let people know give us a few more days, but your product is on the way. So I want to, um, I want to really pause here for a second and, and talk about just what an extraordinary marketing case study this is. So one of the, the beauties of going viral is how much did you pay, uh, to get that five, you know, 500,000, 626,000 views? Did you have to pay anything? Was that, uh, organic? So, so the investment was a time investment. So it was our time resource because creating the video took maybe four to five hours. Yeah. So what time? So, so this in, in marketing language is called an organic post where you're just posting it. You're not paying the platform, whether it's TikTok or Facebook to promote it to a certain audience. And it just kind of goes and oftentimes it sort of hits a couple thousand and sometimes it hits hundreds of thousand. The, the challenge for a marketer is you have no, you have very little control and you rarely have a sense of when it's going to go viral. And so this spike is really hard to plan for and it's not necessarily sustainable because you can't necessarily count on going viral every month. Um, and then one other little interesting tidbit around that is um, Tati shared, if it's okay for me to share this, that um, some of these platforms will, when you're new to it, will give you a little bit of extra juice to make you be seen by more people to help you go viral. And then it's sort of like, a drug addict who's always searching for that initial high and they can never quite get, get it back. Um, and so, so TikTok and many of the other platforms um, will often benefit those who are new to the platform by giving them a little bit of extra juice and helping them go to viral. And then you're just sort of like seeing it, you know, posting and paying and trying to get it again. That's true. Um, I mean, if you look, I, I, you're still seeing my screen the posts that we had done afterwards, we did some posts answering responses that we got to this video. So we not only got 626,000 views, but we got hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of comments that we literally had to go and answer all of the questions on because you can't leave questions unanswered as a brand. And even if you're a small team, you have to be in communication with your clients on social. If they're asking you, you need to respond. So, I mean, that alone took so much time afterwards. So when you think about 
yes, it was an organic video, meaning we didn't have to pay, but we definitely had to use a lot of our time resource in managing this, not to mention running a bunch of people and rushing them over to do a quick manufacturing run. So that was important. But if you take a look here, I mean, we've done some posts afterwards and we got this one that did pretty well, 11,000 views, but the rest are toggling between one and 4,000. So you're absolutely right, Dan. That like yeah. So, so as a business, as a business owner, the, the first challenge with um, going viral is you'll get a spike in demand that's not necessarily repeatable or predictable. And us business owners hate, hate things that aren't predictable. Uh, we'll take it, but see it as kind of a one-time windfall rather than something you can bank on. The real key as a marketer is two things. Number one, when you sell out, you have a really big marketing challenge because you need to make sure you don't alienate all these people who are super psyched about your brand, who are encountering it for the first time, who've made this or want to make this purchase, but they want it right away. So I want to hear uh, Tati about how you managed that, you know, some of the blowback, if you will, of folks who wanted the product and it was sold out. You, you had a huge advantage, which is the fact that you manufacture on site. Because if you have, you know, uh, a, ch an, a, a, a logistical chain that goes back to like China, you know, you're, you're looking at m months before you can actually meet the new demand. And then the other, the other question, which we'll talk about next, is how to manage the, how to try to take that initial bump and then create a relationship from it. Because that's really where you grow the business is in the relationship, not in the initial sale. But let's let's go back to that. You get this like spike in demand. You're sold out within 48 hours. And now you have like lots and lots of people who want to purchase from you. What happens next? Yes. So that's exactly right. That's exactly how it happened. Um, our logistical chain actually does go back all the way to China. but And that's where we source a lot of our raw material. However, um, like I said, because we're manufacturing at an insane amount of volume, not for just ourselves, but for other customers of the manufacturing facility, then we have the unique opportunity to be able to pull from that raw material very quickly to make another batch and to, you know, resupply um, the, that demand. So, so what did we do in terms of customer service and customer management because as you can imagine, we were getting emails when we had to take down. So, so I'll start from the beginning. The first, the, where we really sold out was on Amazon because Amazon only allows you to send to their fulfillment center a certain amount of inventory. And as you start to grow and sales start to increase on Amazon, they open up and they allow you to send a little bit more, a little bit more. So we were sending we were sending what Amazon allowed us to send to the max. So we were sending as much as they would allow us to send. However, once we sold out and they said, okay, replenish, we could replenish, but between the time it took to manufacture, the time it took to then rush deliver, the time it takes Amazon to accept the inventory you've sent and then put it back into their fulfillment centers, that was like a week and a half to two weeks long. So in the meantime, what we had to do is we had to quickly say, okay, we're still going to be selling on Amazon, but we're going to fulfill by merchant, meaning we're going to fulfill the Amazon sales that we get because we sold out in their fulfillment center. And we're going to be fulfilling, obviously, our website sales. So it was a kind of a logistical nightmare. We ended up having to roll up our sleeves and sit there and package and print labels and stick labels and package hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of orders, um, which as a business owner, it kind of gives you it, those moments where you're sitting there and you're filling hundreds of packages of orders. It, it's like these aha moments where you're like, wow, it really is possible. There really are that many people who are looking for this product. And maybe you're not a product, maybe you're a service that are in need of this service. And when you have those aha moments as a small business owner, or, or when you're just starting out, it, it really 
it's like a, it's like a good boost and reassurement that you're on the right track, that you're doing what you're supposed to be doing. Because a lot of times people don't know. I mean, you have market studies, you obviously do your research on, on what the potential market size could look like for your business. But it's not until you have these moments where you're sitting there packaging hundreds of orders that you're like, wow, there really is a demand. So, and we saw the demand. So for the customers who we were either delayed in sending their product or for the customers that said, you know, um, the reality was we had a, a few hiccups in the shipments. Some people that ordered three products and only received one. Um, some people that ordered a multiple set of products and then just received four of the same products. And that happens when you have to quickly pivot and your logistical process isn't in place for that amount of volume. So our goal was get the products out delivered as quickly as possible, no matter what. So when you place the CEO, the CMO, and other people who aren't really used to packaging on a packaging line, you're bound to have errors. You know, you're bound to have when you're trying to move so quickly. So for all the customers, which we did have errors with, which is just the nature of it, we said, we're going to send you a free product on us. We apologize. Um, we're going to fix this. We will reimburse you. We'll send you a free product. But the value of keeping that customer who on that first encounter with the brand may not have had the most seamless experience, that's everything. And so even if you have to reimburse and let them keep the product, that's a decision that you make as a business owner because of the lifetime value potential of that customer. Yeah, I love that. You know, I, I think also to just be real, um, you know, I think it's totally appropriate to say like, hey, you know, we uh, had no idea that this post was going to go viral. We're so honored by the excitement it's generated. We did sell out. And so there's a little bit of a longer, uh, you know, cycle of getting your product. And, and we've been, you know, the CEO is packaging things. We might be making mistakes. Like just to be kind of honest and vulnerable. Um, oh, totally. And we did that. Yeah. Can, can be really, can really be helpful. Um, before we talk about that lifetime value and how to take someone from a first time purchaser to someone who actually is going to have a continued relationship with you. Uh, Susan Sanderson, um, well, actually, uh, Letitia Kalbast, where do most of your online sales come from, your website or Amazon? So, right now, they definitely come from Amazon. Um, we have separate strategies for driving traffic to Amazon than to our website. And we Originally, we're balancing our budgets for both marketplaces, but quickly realized that our purchaser's journey begins on Amazon and then later transitions onto our website. And so if we know they're starting on Amazon, that's where we're prospecting. That's where we're getting new customers. And so our new customers, we attain through Amazon and then we retain them on our website. Well, we migrate them over and then we retain them on our website. Great. And, and that's what a lot of folks do. You know, the, the challenge with Amazon for any e-commerce companies, you don't really own that relationship. Um, you know, they are, um, you know, Amazon doesn't give you a lot of information about people who purchase from you. So it's, it's really very transactional. It's not relationship driven. And when you do it on your website, that's where you have a chance to build a relationship. The, the challenge is how to get people to your website. So you might remember you know, Tati's team were debating what does the TikTok send people to Amazon or does it send people to our website? Because they were getting started, they chose to send people to, to Amazon to kind of just get the product out there. Um, Susan Sanderson asked, how do you translate this to B2B versus B2C? And this is um, totally translatable. What you have to just think about is what we're talking about is a spike in demand that is unexpected and not necessarily sustainable. That's, that's really what going viral is. It's, it's a sudden spike in demand. So, so Susan, imagine you give a talk and you just knock it out of the park and it's for your perfect audience and you have the perfect offer and 15 people come to you right afterwards and they all wanna hire you at the same time. And you only really have the capacity to, hire, to, to take on three or four new clients at a time. 
So how do you manage that situation, right? That's exactly what we're talking about. Your capacity uh, as a business, whether you're B2B or B2C, sees a demand shock that's kind of one time and not necessarily repeatable. Um, and, and how do you manage that as a marketer? So, so Tati, um, you had this spike in demand. Um, you had all these people buying your products for the first time. Um, what now? Like, how do you leverage that to build a business? One of the things you mentioned is that you are seeing now more organic traffic to your website than you were seeing before. So that is a long-term effect. Your brand is kind of out there in a, in a bigger way than it had been before. Yeah. What else are you doing? How else are you trying to, to kind of capture the momentum, bottle the lightning, if you will? So that's a great question. And that's probably the most important question to answer as a business owner is you got the customers. Now, how do you keep them? Because you want them forever. So, and it's a lot easier when you, when you talk about consumable goods. So for our brand supplements, dietary supplements, vitamins, probiotics, those are things that you take that we recommend that you take on a regular basis. So different than something where it's like a one-time remedy, consistency is key when it comes to most dietary supplements. And so what we want to do is number one, explain that to our customers, why it's important that they on a regular basis, turn this into a habit rather than a one-time purchase, but also offer them a way to make it easy. And so adults, people in general have so many things that they need to worry about in their day to day that remembering to go and purchase something or remembering to go and take your vitamins, it's, it's not always, it's just another thing to do. And so how do you make your consumer's life easy? That's a, that was one of the real important questions that we needed to answer. And we did that by creating a subscription option and it is the digital trend these days for direct to consumer goods. Um, I don't need to think about it. I can subscribe. I know that every 30 days, a delivery is going to be on my front doorstep and that makes my life simpler. And so by simplifying the life of the consumer and added value, um, you, you, you start to get and retain a lot of customers. And so we created a program where if you subscribe, and you stay on the subscription for two months, after month three, so on month three rather, you now receive a discount for every single one of your orders moving forward. And so we did it this way because what oftentimes brands will see is that if they offer subscription packages, and it could work for services, but you see it a lot for products, um, people will join for the first month, get the discount, and then drop off. And so we created the program with a two month minimum before you get the discount because we wanna create that loyalty. And also quite frankly, we wanna make sure that the products are working for you. And so take it for two months and then quote unquote, get locked in to the subscription because if it doesn't work, then we do recommend you go and look for another product that does work for you. Um, but two months is key, especially with dietary supplements, because your body does a lot of changing when you start to, now I'm getting sciency, but your body does do a lot of changing when you start to take different minerals, different vitamins, probiotics. And so you need some time to like stabilize and then see if it's actually giving the right effects. And so 60 days was key for us. Does that answer? Yeah, absolutely. And, and how did you do on the 60 day mark? How did you do against that? So, so we actually just had our 30 day mark, um, from the TikTok viral video. And what's funny is uh, our fulfillment team in the warehouse is like, we're going to need some backup tomorrow because we have subscription orders refill on a monthly basis. So it's always going to be the 24th of every single month. And so we now know that on the 24th, 25th, and 26th, towards the end of the month, we've got to staff up for our packaging team so that they can get all of the deliveries out on time. Because now, for the people that did sign up for subscriptions, 
those key days are always the volume just goes up crazy. So it's great. It's great. And, and we are working on turning the one-time buyers into subscribers as well. Right. Are you doing your own fulfillment still? So we have a fulfillment team that does it out of the manufacturing facility where we package, where we manufacture and package the products. Um, but we've since sent over, as you can guess, Amazon increased our maximum uh, amount. So we've since sent over two shipments already to Amazon. Recently. Got it. Yeah. Within, within the month, within the 30 days of that TikTok viral video. All right. So um, I want to do, th thank you for sharing uh, you know, the, 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 the mixed blessing, uh, of, of a viral. And I want to take a minute now and just kind of do a couple rapid fire questions. You know, as we mentioned at the top, you went from being, uh, an agency working on behalf of other brands, often big brands to kind of a scrappy CMO of a, of a, of a growing, uh, e-commerce company. Yeah. What were, um, just kind of in a sentence or two, three of the biggest lessons you learned in, in your first year as CMO? So the first one I shared in the beginning, but it is so true. Done is better than perfect. And if you start to get things done quicker and on a timely basis, you will learn how to add perfection into that and layer that in. But just get it done, put it up, it can always be better. Yes, it can always be better, but that comes with time. Okay, so done is better than perfect is one. What's the second? Okay. Done is better than perfect. Um, customer service is very, very critical. And when I came into this role as CMO, I knew that I was going to have to wear a lot of hats. Um, I had originally worked with teams of tens of tens and tens of people that could take on different roles for me. And I would just sort of like delegate. But with me, I knew that I was going to have to get into the weeds. And I'm really glad that I did. And especially the customer service component, because there's something really interesting that's called the feedback loop. And customers through their customer servants, whether it's a complaint or a question, will give you ideas on how to run your business better. Products to develop, um, solutions to implement. So customer service became very quickly one of the most important areas. And while I don't manage it a lot now anymore, I'm glad I did in the beginning. All right, so customer service is marketing. So what's, uh, what's the third one? And I think the third, the third sort of like aha is for me particularly who came from the agency world, I quickly realized that marketing might not always be the priority when you're running a business and hear me out. It's important, but I being from the agency world was used to marketing being the focus. My clients were marketers and we were talking about marketing, how to sell and how to grow your business through marketing. But when you're a business owner the, the focus isn't always marketing. You have inventory challenges, logistical, operational challenges. I mean, the list goes on. Marketing is one of those pieces. And so understanding the 360, all departments of your business um, is critical. And it is reflected in some of the marketing that you end up doing. Um, but yeah, so I guess that's more of like a, a self-realization. Yeah. That's the most important. <laughs> You know, I think honestly, too few businesses value marketing, especially businesses that um, have been able through word of mouth and referrals and the friends and family network to kind of organically just grow that way. Um, but what I will say is that marketing, uh, you always end up hitting a wall. Uh, you know, whether, you know, I've had uh, in the BizHack program, uh, Inc. 1000 companies that have never marketed. They basically just relied on the Rolodex of their CEO. But one day they got to a point where they weren't able to generate enough reliable business to keep the business at its same place. And you know, the challenge for many businesses is the bigger you grow, the, the harder the marketing challenge becomes. 
Um, and so building in, baking in, investing in marketing from day one is incredibly important. And um, a lot of times when you're in-house, you're advocating for something that when you're at an agency is almost like comes, uh, is obvious to everyone. Um, all right, so another question that I wanted to ask you, which is a really kind of nor boring and nerdy question, but something that I know you're pretty passionate about because you're, like me, a secret nerd, uh, is about standard operating procedures or what are known as SOPs. So this is a way for you to systematize your marketing and to make a small team be able to achieve more. Can you talk just briefly about what is this SOP and how you've been able to implement those as CMO? Yes, so very, very important, standard operating procedures. So you can kind of think of that as the guidelines or the rule books for every single thing that you do in a business. It's kind of like a recipe. So in a recipe, you have the ingredients that you need to use, then you have numbered instructions in chronological order of how to bake a cake, yeah, make a pie, make a jerky, whatever. So. SOPs are kind of like a recipe. It's, this is our way to get from one point to another, to accomplish this goal, to do this task. This is how we do it. And when you want to build a business that's scalable, you have to create, you have to create SOPs in order to hand off projects from the original owner to somebody who's now joining your team. So I'll give you a good example. Um, when we do our customer service, we've created what's called a response matrix. And the response matrix says, every time we get a question about this, we're gonna answer one of these three ways. And it's a copy and paste. And so that way you can number one, ensure consistency. You're always responding and you're, and you're consistent with how you're answering certain types of questions. And that creates credibility for the brand, but also it's quicker because now you can just grab responses and, and paste and answer more questions and get to more customers in a faster, in a faster manner. So that's an SOP. That's an example of an SOP. And we have that for our processes in hiring, for our processes in, in launching advertisements on Facebook. It's different for Instagram. It's different now for TikTok but creating those documents that give the instructions of how to do every part of your business is critical for growth, critical. You know, one of the things that, um, I mean, you really can't scale a company and you definitely can't scale your efforts if you don't build SOPs. They're, they're a little bit painful to build on the front end, but they have a huge um, uh, value over time. You know, one of the um, concepts that I recently learned about was this concept of buying back your time. So buying back your time is hiring someone who will then save you time uh, in the long term. And so one of the ways to buy back time is to do something yourself, write an SOP, and then hire someone who can do it for you. So you're therefore paying them to buy back time on your calendar to do bigger and, and other things. So we have a few more minutes left before we go. Um, stepping uh, back for a second and thinking now, not only of the uh, work you're doing as CMO, but all the incredible work you've done as a coach and instructor for years now with BizHack, um, are there any advice or guidance that you have to companies that are small, that have small budgets, uh, small staffs, limited in expertise, in terms of what are some of your biggest takeaways in terms of how to market themselves despite those constraints? So one of my recommendations, and I, this applies to me, who I've been in the marketing world and industry my entire career, you never stop learning. And the moment you think you know it all is the moment you'll go under because the digital space is not going to stop and it's not going to stop evolving and changing. And so being able to understand that you're going to need resets and refreshes of things that you've learned in the past is critical. And I'll give you a perfect example. I used to be very, very knee deep in ads manager. Ads manager is the platform in which you run your Facebook ads. And 
now that I'm delegating that to someone else, I've made sure to let them know and inform me of any changes within the platform because it's changing so often. And so I need to understand if implementing my strategy now is going to be different because of a shift in a platform. And that's just one example, but you're always, always learning with digital because we're getting smarter. Robots are getting smarter. Algorithms are getting smarter. And now there's more options and opportunities to provide better quality contact and a better customer experience with your brand across any platform that they're interacting with social, your website, other marketplaces, email, the list goes on and the list will continue to grow. <laughs> Absolutely. And I mean, the key, whenever you're thinking about, should I be on clubhouse, which we're going to talk about in a few weeks, I hope you come to that. Should I be on TikTok? It really comes down to, is my ideal customer there? And if the answer is no, or I'm not sure, then do a little bit more research or proceed with caution. Um, could you open the Q and A? There are two questions, Tati, that I'd love for you to address. Absolutely. Um, let's see. Okay. The last note is, Dan, it's not a secret. <laughs> Love the recipe simile. It's no, it's, um, it's, it's in the Q&A. The first one is from Camilla Ceballos. It's, do you know where one can find on-site metrics in Amazon so you can track, you know, sales and referrals? Just a quick question on that. Oh, okay, here, sorry, I, I just found the Q&A. So um, on-site metrics in Amazon, Amazon's fulfillment center, so the login that you have when you're selling on Amazon, sends you back information about your sales. So it's all within the Amazon dashboard when you, when you create an account for as a seller account. So that's all in there. Um, that should give you all of the data that you're, that you're looking for, for Amazon sales specifically. So Leticia Kalb asked, speaking of scalability, what platforms are you using to scale your business? Shopify, Salesforce. Uh, Shopify is a web, uh, website manager. It's a, uh, and then Sh Sh Salesforce is a CRM uh, for relationship management. Yes. So we use Shopify. That's our marketplace for our website. We use Klaviyo for emails. We've found that they're best for e-commerce sales and direct to consumer. And then we also use 99designs and Upwork to find different partners and different vendors that we wanna work with on particular projects. So those are some great platforms to look for qualified um, subject matter experts when as a business, you know that you don't have the time to do it all. You can source some really good people there. Perfect. Next question from Sharon McKiernan. What tips do you have for transitioning from agency to client side? Woo, boy. <laughs> um, I will say that pivoting from agency to client side at first seems like a vacation because when you're on the agency side, you and I who manage multiple clients, you're constantly focusing on one thing and then shifting a focus on something else. And so you're working on different brands, which is a little straining on like on the mind because you're, you're having to pivot so much when you're focusing on just one product on the customer side, on the client side, when you're starting your brand, you're only thinking about that one product. And so you feel like a whole weight has lifted off your shoulders. But then what you realize is rather than being horizontally spread out, now you're very vertically spread out where you have to think about that one product, but you have to think about so many different elements of that one product or that one brand. And so for me, that was my biggest like difference is you, you feel like you go on a vacation, but then you quickly realize that you're just always on and you're on 24 seven. That's the truth. Perfect. Tati, I have a uh, gardener outside my window. So any, uh, any final thoughts before uh, we wrap up? No. So this was, th th these are the things that happen when we all end up working from home for over a year. I mean, yes, I luckily today's not gardening day, but I am at home. So um, what have I learned? Well, so I hope that, I hope that you guys took away um, 
some good tips for those of you who are small business owners or just starting out. Um, and I wanted to give you guys, the audience, an offer. Um, we, I think Lilia put in the chat the links to purchase our products. So we talked a lot about Happy V, that's our women's wellness line, but we also launched an immunity line that we're selling only on Amazon right now. It's an Amazon exclusive line. We've got three products, a zinc, a vitamin C, and an elderberry. So as you can imagine, we quickly pivoted to create the second brand in response to the global pandemic. <laughs> and so we found that, you know, if we have the resources and the capabilities to quickly put up a brand that's gonna help from the immunity space, we're gonna do that. And so right now we're offering free products. So what you need to do to get your free product is purchase it by clicking the links um, provided and then email me your confirmation number and your PayPal address and I will reimburse you 100% of the expense for that product. Um, it's sort of like our doing good for friends and family because we can all use a little extra immune boosting these days. Um, so yeah, if you're interested, we've got those three products that are completely free. Email me at Tati, I'm gonna type it in here, Tati at happyv.com with your purchase confirmation number and we'll PayPal you that same day, the same amount that you that you ordered. One per one per person. So if you order 50 vitamin C's, we can reimburse you for one, <laughs> but we will give you one free product. Perfect. Thank you so much, Tati. I love having you a part of the BizHack family and congratulations on your amazing transition. Uh, you, you're such a talent and we're all so lucky to be able to share in some of your reflected light. Thank you. Um, Thank you. We'll also include that special offer information in the follow-up email that will come out, go out tomorrow uh, so that you can buy that product and, and give it to a friend or family or use it for yourself. Um, next week, we're gonna be talking about our lead building system. Uh, I'm really excited to share this with you. Uh, please bring friends. This is kind of my signature achievement of seven years of teaching this stuff, all compressed down into 90 minutes. Then we have our graduation celebration, and then we're gonna talk about another platform a lot of you guys have questions about, which is TikTok. Um, I also wanted to encourage those of you who are interested in our paid program, of which Tati is one of our amazing instructors. Uh, it starts in a little over four weeks. Uh, I'm happy to report that we're more than halfway filled. Uh, and so the class is filling up um, and would encourage you, if you are interested, uh, to apply by going to try.bizhack.com slash scholarship. Um, if you do apply for the scholarship, um, which is for women and minority-owned businesses. Um, you will be invited to an info session that we're holding um, in next week toward, on Thursday at noon, uh, where we'll get all of your questions answered to ensure that the program is really a fit for you and where you're looking to go with your business. And so with that, I just wanna say thank you, become part of the BizHack family, uh, and uh, we'll see you next week at the Lead Building System webinar. Thanks everybody.